Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I'm your host, somewhat still standing with a voice. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. And folks, we have a very special guest on the line. I don't want to say friend of the show because, honestly, he's like family to us. He is, I believe now, the official record holder for most guest appearances on the ODPH. Yes, so and that's and that's a, a, a quite an honor to be had because if we keep bringing him back, you guys keep asking us to bring him back. We love having him back on the show, and he has a brand new book that if you need to find more information about, it's in the liner notes of this podcast episode. Plus, if you go to ODPH social media, you can find it. And Pad, where do you go to find out anything about the ODPH? ODPHpodcast dot com. Right on, because you can go right to the front section of the page. You can click on that beautiful cover, and it'll give you all the information about the next big thing in independent comics, Pocus Hocus number five, a.k.a. Pocus Hocus V2, a.k.a. Pocus Hocus V1-5. And however you want to break it down, it's an issue you need to have in your hands. And there's one person that can definitely talk about it better than I can. Ladies and gentlemen of the ODPH Society, please welcome back to the show, the one and only Alan Dunford, writer of Pocus Hocus. Alan, what's going on? Oh my goodness! I, it's, uh, that's probably my favorite part about coming on this is just listening to uh, the new, fun, and creative ways that you introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is all ad lib so, yeah, too. I think, yeah. So I I think um, we can usually just cut the interview off after that because it's all just it's all just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, no, I am I am great. I'm so happy to be back. And uh, again, like always, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, yeah, I, let's get into this thing. Yeah, I mean, because obviously last time we talked to you was Chainsaw Grandma, and obviously that's been a big hit. So, I mean, tell us, how has things been from then to now? Um, Strange. So, you know, we, we did Grandma Chainsaw, and uh, for an issue one, it, it did really well. Um, it surpassed our expectations, without a doubt. Um, but it was funny because whenever we, we went to go launch Grandma Chainsaw, you know, we, we were messaging and, and sending it out uh, to eat people that back Pocus Hocus and everything, because that's where our fan base is right now. And we're like, hey, we, we're working on something else in between the, the next issue of Pocus, and it's about a serial killer grandma. We know it's totally different. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, people were excited about it, but we still got the question of, you know, oh, this looks cool, but when's the next Pocus coming out? And we're like, okay, soon. Um, and then we, we go to launch Pocus 5, and then we're getting messages now that are like, when's the next grandma coming out? <laughs> it's just, it's, it's funny just, just to kind of see, um, you know, uh, different people's reaction to, to how the books are and everything. And, um, you yeah, know, before we get too much in the focus, because Grandma Chainsaw 2 is going to be our next campaign that we're running. And of course, I'll be, you know, bugging you guys again to bring me back on for that. Yeah, we've already booked uh, that. That's, that's, a, that's a no-brainer. Fucking twist our arm, okay. why don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So it was funny, though, because the feedback we got from Grandma Chainsaw was uh, was pretty universal. Um, it, it seemed like everyone really liked it, and they all had the same no, – I don't want to call it a critique, but the, the same feeling. They were like, we thought we had it figured out, but we didn't expect any of it, and we want more. And, and that made us feel like we we're definitely on the right direction. Oh, I think so. I think the, the book, without giving too much away about it, was not was what I was expecting at all. I love the ending of issue one. It And I, like I say, I cannot wait to check out issue two because it's not just your average horror comic, but there's so many different things you throw in there that it's like, okay, you have my attention and now yeah, the issue's so, over. <laughs> yeah. That was one of those things where um, we, we kind of made the decision early to, to not talk about certain things. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Uh, could we have marketed it a little bit differently if we would have revealed some of the stuff that was going to come up, yeah. Uh, would we have maybe grown our audience a little bit? Probably, uh, because it was one of those where 
the, how we pitched it, we pitched it like it was a very stereotypical. Um, for, you know, it's just a slasher, four people get lost, and we just wanted to leave it there. But we, we didn't want to do our fans a disservice because we wanted them to have something in their hands that felt fun, new, and fresh and bizarre. And we wanted everyone just to be completely surprised by all the twists and turns that the story has taken, even just in issue one. So that's why we're, we're so excited now for issue two, because we can obviously start talking about certain things, especially like the ending, because all of our books, where they end, the next one immediately begins. So we, we can't stray away from the, the cast of characters that we meet at the end. No, absolutely not. And, and trust me when I say this, if you have not gotten a chance to check out uh, Chainsaw Grandma, you need need to go check it out as soon as you can, wherever you can find a copy, seriously. But that being said, Pocus Hocus is returning. Obviously, has been a runaway smash hit on Kickstarter. What is now heading into this campaign? What has been the biggest ch- uh, changes in planning and strategy for this new campaign? Um, you know, we we talked about this a little bit in the uh, the green room before we went on. Um, so it's kind of nice to elaborate on it a little bit more. But this is our it, issue four ended our first arc, and from where this is our first comic series, it was kind of. It's, it's hard to figure out how do you market this thing now, right? Mm-hmm. Like, do you market it as volume five, which it is. It's a continuation. It's immediately after issue four ends, issue five begins. Do we, do we market it as that? Or will newcomers be too intimidated and say, oh, well, you know, there's, there's five issues now. Because we always want to make sure we have fans new and old. Because, you know, not everyone that has read, you know, issue issue one or two of Pocus Hocus is going to come back for the next one hmm. because you always can't plan for that. Right. So you, you want to also grow your audience and have new people. So we were figuring, well, do we market it as volume two, number one, or will people think they need to read volume one for it? So it was all just so, so many weird marketing decisions that we had to try to make. But, um, you know, we even switched up the title, the Kickstarter a little bit. And after we did that, it seemed like it, it kind of, uh, meshed a little bit better. Uh, with the direction of the book, because yeah, chapter five does begin volume two, but it is also a continuation of the series. And, um, you know, with every campaign that we do, we always have catch up tiers for people that are coming in new. And uh, we always try to build an a la carte system. So that way, let's say someone backed number three and then get number four, they can back issue five and add on number four. So we, we really just try to make it fair for everyone, and we don't try to, like, you know, strong-arm anyone into buying, like, a huge tier or tier they don't need with extra junk just so they can get caught up or, or just get a cover that they want. No, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense, too, because the one thing is, for, with every campaign, you're going to have new eyes on your project. So right. you, you definitely want to come with something different, something fresh, and especially if somebody's coming in because they hear about this on a podcast or at the comic shops or wherever they get their comic news – Word of mouth has been something that I notice with Pocus Hocus especially has really been a driving force, like the whole DIY movement of it. And if anybody doesn't believe me, you watch from what's happened from issue to issue that we have done here personally. Like I'll just take it from just the ODPH perspective. Every review that we have done for Pocus Hocus has like almost doubled in views every time out. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, legitimately. And yeah, that's awesome. yeah, like it, it's crazy to, to say, but it's like every time, like it grows more and more. And then we always have people asking like, oh, when's the next issue? Where do I find out more? And then it's just usually me sending out DM links and like, here, go get the copies yourself. But it's one of those things that more people are like, I hear about this book. What can you tell me about this? What, you know, why, why is it so great? And I'm like, if you read it, it's self-explanatory. Like it holds its own for being, you know, a great mix of humor and horror and, you know, all meshed together. And then you think about, like, especially in this day and age, just with word of mouth and how important that is, the, you know, if you want to call it a viral moment, but it's like when somebody catches wind and starts playing the game of telephone, I mean, that's the easiest way to really create some buzz. And you guys have that right now. I mean, that's just got to be such an incredible feeling. Oh, yeah, w- without a doubt, because, um, you know, I think I say this every time we're on here. We are our own worst critics. And- yeah. Um, you know, you, you second guess yourself and, and you just want to make sure you want to make sure you're always trying to do fun and innovative things. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you look at your, your fellow peers <coughs> and everyone around you and it's, 
it's cool to to watch them and see what they're doing. And you, you just, I don't know. I, I think one thing about this team is that we're trying to learn from everybody. And we even try to learn from ourselves. So even in our group chat, we're always trying to uh, improve what each other's doing. And even from a writing standpoint, like these guys, uh, they challenge what Will and I are doing. And it, it, I feel like it makes us better for it. And because this team, we, we want to put out the best possible book that we can. And, you know, personally, you know, I, I think probably about everyone would say this, but um, I, I, I do feel like our issues keep getting better and better because uh, Brian has like such a good handle on, on what we're doing and where we're going. And uh, he kind of knows what we're, what we're really looking for. And, and Jason knows how to step up his collaring on certain things now because we're also comfortable with each other. So it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's something so cool to see. And um, you know, we were talking about just seeing the growth and everything, you know, uh, for, for those who don't know, uh, this got picked up by Source Point Press, so we we can't say too too much right now. But uh, definitely expect to see this thing in comic book shops this year. That's amazing, uh, dude! Yeah, it's wow. It, it's a weird feeling <laughs> because we feel like it just kind of happened out of nowhere. No, but I mean that's a testament to you and your team. Like everybody at Top Hat Studios is like, you can just tell when you read a book, like how much the creators are invested. And you know, you hit it right on the head when you say you're your own toughest critic because you care. Like, this is your project you're putting out to the world. Like, you, you, yeah. you know, and you know that you have a lot of eyes looking at it. Like, you, like, and it's just trying to, you know, gauge about how much the audience is you know, in size wise. But you always have somebody looking at it. So you definitely want to make a great first impression. And I think you guys do that. And But it's always that thing to be your own worst critic. Because whenever you do something in, in art and in podcasting and TV, movies, whatever, et cetera, et cetera you're going to want to make sure you leave that lasting impression that people want to come back and see it or hear it or whatever the case is. So if you're not tough on yourself, then who else is going to be, you know? Yeah. We were, um, we were so nervous whenever we went to go release, uh, grandma chainsaw because we didn't know how people were going to take it. Right. Um, but then after we, we did get back a, a lot of feedback, we were so happy and it let us know that we were <laughs> definitely on the right track because, um, it, it genuinely, we felt like it left people wanting more. So that was, uh, that was something really cool to see too. And it just motivates us, you know, to keep pushing forward and, and trying to tell fun new stories. Um, you know, I, I talked about it with you before and we got asked to do a short story for Roseblood Manor. Um, yeah. and we absolutely were, were over the moon with, uh, with how that turned out because it was our first take on a short story. And, um, yeah, uh, we, they asked us to come back for issue two. And we, we can't wait to reveal that a little bit later. Oh, let's go, man. That's awesome. I'm so happy for you guys. Like, seriously, when you yeah. put in the work, I always love to see people that are hustling and working and grinding get, get success like this, man. That's awesome. I mean, that's just motivating yeah. anybody out there hearing this. Like, it's, uh, it's, it's a really good feeling uh, just to yeah, – because, like, I have all these crazy stories and this huge overactive imagination, um, and it's just it, – it's nice to be able to put it on paper – and be with a team that that kind of gets it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we're, we're all weird. Everybody's weird, whether they want to admit it or not. And it's just fun to, to be with another group of weirdos that are like-minded. And, and we just, you know, try to produce just this wacky, crazy stuff. Yeah, no, that truly helps. If you got a like-minded team, you can really conquer the world, to be honest with you. Like, it's just when everybody's on the same page and giving off that same energy and same drive, like, it's scary to see what you can accomplish, for, like, for real. So one other thing that I noticed you guys did this time out is the video package for the Kickstarter. So I know we've shared this on ODPH uh, YouTube, but can you give us a little behind the scenes, like, where was this idea come from and, you know, how this all came to be? Because I really think it's a nice piece to really go after, like, in the digital age here. Uh, are we talking, like, the trailer that we yes. made for it? Okay, yeah, perfect. So um, we, we got in touch with... Uh, Jared, his name is Jared Matthew Dahl, and he works with Prevalent Mind Studios. And we, he did a trailer for us for Pocus Hocus. Oh God, I think it was three, is when we first introduced it, and we were so blown away with that. And then he did a trailer for us for Grandma Chainsaw, and then that's what sold us on on Jared's abilities. Like, not saying he wasn't great before, but just seeing that was just unreal. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it has just been a, uh, it's just been a match made in hell ever since yeah. so we, 
we definitely fully intend to use Jared for this just because um, he gets it. And it's just, I, I think it, it adds a lot to it. If someone can jump into your Kickstarter and yeah, uh, you know, videos aren't recommended. You, you don't have to do anything too crazy, but we just like it from a, I don't know, just fun, unique perspective. Right. Mm hmm. No, I mean, I, I think it helps, too, because you see a lot of the bigger companies doing that now. Like, I know Marvel's done it a couple times. Image has done it. Boom Studios. So I think that definitely helps, and especially it's something very relatable now to fans because they almost expect it to a degree. Okay, yeah, and, and that makes total sense. Um, you know, we, we'd like to try to have the visual aid and try to drive the excitement behind it because, you know, from from our perspective, we feel like – Pocus is a very uh, theatrical and cinematic type of experience. Uh, Brian's artwork and Jason's coloring is just, it's unreal. And I feel like it kind of pulls you in mm -hmm. and all the books, you know, not, not trying to discredit mine and Will's writing, but yeah, they, they read pretty fast, yeah. I think. And that's just a testament to, uh, I think the pacing of the story and, and the structure of how, how Brian has been laying out the pages and everything. And it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's cool to see it that way. And we definitely think that a trailer lends itself really well to that part. Uh, so in case anyone needs a little bit of refresher, cause Hey, there are a lot of comics coming out these days. Uh, what is Pocus about exactly? Oh, okay. So Pocus is a, it's a Faustian tale. So, like, and I like to make the joke that, you know, there, there's, this is one of the oldest stories ever told. There's even a song about a guy going to Georgia in, in the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a story about a magician whose name is Pocus Hocus, uh, who sells his soul to a demon to have actual magical powers. And as these things go, they never go as planned. So this is Pocus's journey to get his soul back. Um, and it, it's obviously it's, it's, mediocre spoiler territory at this point but um we we find out who actually has pocus's soul and that's where the second arc begins is our journey into that dimension uh but the way i just described this i promise you it's it's a lot funnier than <laughs> it is <laughs> no it absolutely is like i say the humor is something that you don't expect when you start reading this and then it really hits like sweet baby satan Still cracks yeah. me up to this day. It's just it's like little stupid stuff that you can kind of throw <laughs> in me. there. Yeah, but but yeah, um, we, that was one of the things that we we tried to aim for at the beginning was we wanted to make something that was you know in our opinion funny and unique, and um, yeah, humor is so hard to do, but um, we we hope that we at least got close to it. No, I, I think you guys definitely really hit it too. And now with issue five or volume two coming out. Is there any spoilers we can talk about? Any any themes we should be really focusing in on? Yeah. Um, so with, with this one, the we it, the, the book is still very funny. Um, we we cracked ourselves up uh, writing this thing. I think this was probably the hardest that we actually ever laughed. Um, we introduced a new character who is a uh, who's kind of a field guide of sorts. Uh, to get us through this new world and to traverse where all we need to go. Um, and that was probably the hardest that Will and I have ever laughed while writing something. Mm. Um, just because this character is just so stupid and so crazy that we, we never thought we'd be able to make something like this, but it just kind of worked in the realm of everything. But um, even in the ash can that we have, uh, you can tell that there's definitely a darker tone to this one. And that was uh, without a doubt on purpose because the the stakes are getting higher. Yeah. We're we're getting to a point now where actions have consequences and everything that Pocus has done, whether it has been selling his soul for his own personal gain or, or selling his soul to impress his father, um, all these actions have consequences. And it it really plays well with the theming of the book with what we're going for, especially in this realm, whenever we really start to get a deep dive into the, uh, the character that Lilith is. Ooh. Okay. I'm excited. Well, I was already excited to begin with, but I love this, yeah. uh, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try not fanboying out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, you know, like I said, it, because it, issues one through four, it's light, whimsical. There, there's still some sinister, uh, 
I guess sinister nature to the thing, but this one we're we're pretty on the nose with, you know the you got to get your head straight focus because mm. this this is serious now right um but of course like i said we, we still have a blast working on this thing and that's and that's the best thing too is like you go into these new arcs and it's always kind of like a gamble so to speak but you can still tell the energy is still there and that's the yeah. big thing that you guys are all still having fun doing this and that's what it should be at the end of the day because that does translate to the readers so much and also another thing that I know you have coming out too, well, actually it's been out for a little bit now, is a sub stack. And this has been something that's been popping up on a lot of writers lately. So can you talk a little bit about your sub stack or Top Hat Studios and how this all came to be? Yeah. Um, sub stack mm-hmm. is, th- this is what I will say about it. Um, we, we're always learning, like I said, and we, we want to we want to know what our peers are doing. Um, why they're successful because we also want to be successful too. Who, who doesn't in, in this world. Right. right. Um, so <clears throat> we, we've talked to them to see what they're doing, what they've noticed, things like that. And the, the common response that we get is that a sub stack is the way to go mm-hmm. because social media is obviously, and you guys know this too, it's, it's bad for, for bogging down, um, the algorithm, right? Yeah. So your your post can get lost, and depends on what time of day you post and everything. But but an email, stereotypically, I mean, granted, I, I fall victim to this sometimes. But you know, you're supposed to check your email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not saying everyone does, but but you do need to sometimes. Yeah, I, um, I, the stories I could tell, like yeah, yeah. So so having an email direct link to somebody is so much better, and has worked out better for us in the long run too. Because we're able to to do stuff on there that we normally wouldn't be able to do uh, from a stereotypical social media standpoint, because we can show off our projects that we're working on. Uh, you know, like let's say we're we're showing off uh, Grandma Chainsaw Two. Uh, whenever that campaign is being close to completed, we can actually send that over to everyone in our Substack mailer list and be like, "Hey, get an early look at the campaign." Instead of it just being the notify me on launch page, you can look and see everything that we have on there. And let us know what you like and what you don't like. And that way we can kind of fine tune it a little bit and maybe take something away that we thought was a good idea that maybe people are like, no, nah, it's kind of stupid. No one's going to buy this reward. Right. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we we want the feedback. We right. We want to know when we're doing well, but we also really want to know when we're doing bad because it's it's our promise to you guys that we deliver the best product possible. And the only way we can do that is if we listen to you. No, I th- I think that's very honest, and that's something you want too, because you want to make that connection. Like I'm in a, a few different subsects too, and it's always very telling about like, who really wants to make that connection and really jumps in those chats and really gets that yeah. back and forth the one on ones. Yeah, like I said, like you know that's and I think that's important that a lot of people need need to do that too. It's we we just want to know why you like us. <laughs> yeah. We want to know why you're you know why you're here. So that way we can keep pushing forward and making sure that we're what we don't fall into different conventions and we're always delivering. Yeah. Like I said before, something fun and unexpected. Uh, so with that in mind, with top hat studios, what have you, what have you guys got coming uh, this year? Okay. So this year, obviously we're, we're trying to be careful with how we stagger these releases, but as of right now, you know, subject to change, all that stuff, however you want to look at it. Um, we are going to be launching poke. We got Pocus Hocus going right now. Uh, and after this is done, also you can pick up grandma chainsaw on this. So if you missed it, it's an add on, uh, because the next book we have coming out is grandma chainsaw two. Um, while that campaign is running, we will have, um, I think the Roseblood Manor campaign is going to be running for that one too. Okay. Then after that, we're looking like we're going to be doing, depending on how it lines up, We'll either be doing Pocus 6 or Grandma Chainsaw 3. Uh, The reasoning for Grandma Chainsaw 3 this early is because uh, I'm not saying we're on a clock or anything like that, but we, you know, we're poised for that one to be solicited in shops whenever issue four of that is finished. So we also want to try to get that out as soon as possible, too. So that way everyone can celebrate with us for the launch of Pocus yeah, once that comes out to comic shops, and then we can also celebrate that much sooner when Grandma Chainsaw comes out. 
That's a big lineup for 2023, man. I'm so excited to see it when those projects come out, man. Yeah, we we're very we're very excited. Um, we're obviously cautiously optimistic, nervous, however you want to look at it. But we uh, we just feel like we just feel like this team is is just doing such a good job, and they're doing more than Will or myself could ever ask for. And just just thank them to the moon and back. Uh, and that's all you can really do is, like I said, when you have that teamwork, it makes the dream work, as they say. Yes. Yeah, the, the dream, it brought, we all want the same dream, so we feel like it's working then. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so before we let you go, obviously, we're going to ask you a couple fun questions. And obviously, the last 24 hours has been dominated by DC Films because they've yes. released their brand new slate of projects coming out. So the question I have for you is, if Pocus was getting picked up for something, would you want to see it be a live action movie, a TV show, or an animated show? Obviously, my my gut reaction is to see it as a as a live action, um, but I think it would serve really well as just a strong animated film. Okay. Um, now, if you ask Will, my co writer, he would tell you he would want to see this thing as a stage play. Really, I can see that though. I can I can definitely see that. Yeah. Pocus is very theatric, um, and it just kind of lends itself pretty easy to to that whole medium. But yeah, Pocus or Will would want to see Pocus as a stage play. Yeah, like I say, it, it could definitely lean in that route too. Like I, I was always kind of going back and forth about because I could see live action would be awesome, but special effects might be a little tough. But yeah, I could definitely yeah. <laughs> see, see the animated animated version would definitely work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I honestly <clears throat> I wouldn't care. Just want, I just want to see this thing in any form, and I'll be I'll be so happy. Yeah, no, I mean I, yeah. I'm I'm not saying it's it's it, like I could let me just say this I could definitely see it happening at some point, just because yeah. word of mouth is picking up and you know, there's now so much of a focus about picking up certain books and making that transition, and I think now obviously it's a little kind of weird time you're hearing with a uh, you know certain streaming services and such you know cutting back and and kind of you know lessening what they're doing. But I could definitely see, like, with a book like this, it will definitely come back in full swing. And this could be something yep. down the road. It could be picked up for something. Like that. Yeah, it, it's just tailor-made for it. Yeah, it would just be – that would be an absolute dream if we ever got anything like that. Like, I, I think that's what everyone would want, right? Um, it's just – I don't know. It's just so surreal to, to think about it. It's just – it's even surreal just to think about it, you know, being able to open up an issue of previews and be like, hey, I'm in there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's what's going to be, like, really nuts. And then just to see it happen with Pocus 1, Pocus 2, Pocus 3, Pocus 4, and then we see Grandma Chainsaw in there. It's just going to be like, God, where, where where does the time go? Um and I think I think we talked about this last time, but it's just it's kind of wild because we're at the point now where our Kickstarters, the covers are considered to be exclusive because whenever we get into shops, uh, you won't be able to have these covers that we're selling on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. The only way to get them is just to back the campaign because um, you know, and it makes sense. The Source Point Press they they want all new covers that we haven't used before. Well, and that makes sense. Yeah. That. Yeah, so we already have four new Brian Belando and Jason Smith covers already done, um, and they are uh, they're some of my favorites uh, that we have for the thing. So it's just uh, yeah, it's just cool. No, that'd be awesome. And now, if there is one song that's on your Spotify playlist that sums up Hocus Hocus number five, what is that song? Oh man, I'm I'm going to say. <sighs> Man, I didn't expect that one. Let's let's go with something like super heavy. Okay. Let let's do the fly and the bee by Darko. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah, let, let, I'm sticking with that one. No, nah, that definitely works. I know. I <laughs> I, I know a couple of our listeners are are, are really going to be popping right now that they're talking. Yeah. You know, you're talking some real metal right there. Yeah. Let's let's do that one just because uh, I love those guys anyway. Um. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're gonna stick with Darko for this. All right, fair enough. All right, so Alan, before we let you go, final pitch. If anybody is not sold about going to odphpodcast.com, click in the link right now, sign it up for one book, two books, three books, however many books that, that you're going to be you know, selling. A, because obviously everybody needs a copy. It's a perfect Valentine's Day gift to somebody else. It, it is a perfect Valentine's gift. How do, that's how you tell someone you love them by, you say, what Pocus did for, for the blind ambitions of his father, I would do for you. Bam. Oh, my yeah. God. It writes itself. <laughs> 
that that needs to be on a Valentine's card. But yep. if if we need to sell that to anybody, what's the final pitch? Pocus Hocus uh, number five. Yeah. So again, Pocus Hocus. Uh, it's just a wild, fun tale about a a magician on the journey to get his soul back we kind of throw everything at the wall and hope it sticks um you know we got action comedy drama horror suspense there's plenty of demon carnage to go around on top of all that so i I just think it's a it's a very fun ride and if you like any of that stuff if you're a huge fan of del toro evil dead I, i i think that uh pocus will maybe check off those boxes for you absolutely Seriously, folks, if you can hear the sound of my voice and you can hear through my cold, trust me when I say this. Go over to odphpodcast.com, click on the link, make sure you have a copy of Pocus Hocus number five. Make sure you get Grandma Chainsaw in there as well. You want to make sure you're on top of what's going on with Top Hat Studios. They put out amazing work each time out, and they are truly a DIY team behind this. You're definitely going to get your money's worth and then some for sign up for the Kickstarters. And just keep an eye out for them because they got a big 2023 ahead of them, which Alan will be back on the show to talk about very, very shortly as well. Alan, can't say thank you enough for coming back on the show, my friend. Yeah, and I, I can't say thank you enough for, for having me on. So, yeah, really, I appreciate you guys to, to the moon and back. Oh, absolutely. That being said, folks, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Anthony. And I'm Dr. Issues. And we're hosts of Capes on the Couch, the podcast where comics get counseling. Superheroes don't always get to go home happy. That's where we come in. We offer psychiatric and mental health analysis of comic book characters. So check us out at capesonthecouch.live and across all social media platforms at Capes on the Couch. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And there is some big, big DC film news that dropped on us finally. Good Lord, yeah. So James Gunn decided to take to social media and unveil the next 10 projects under his regime Mm -hmm. for DC Studios. Now, obviously, everybody knows him. Peter Safran took over the reins uh, late last year. Yep, some point last year. And there has been a buzz going on about what the future is of DC films. So meetings have been had. Uh, summits have been had with with organize, organization plans of like what they're going to do, what they're planning out, and plotting the whole future of the DC universe. Right. So we have all been speculating since that point what's going to happen. Mephisto. Yep. Oh, I mean, so, oh sorry, wrong franchise. The wrong franchise. But when we heard Henry Cavill was no longer going to be playing the role of Superman, that definitely had a very polarizing reaction mm-hmm. amongst the fandom. Mm-hmm. That was the only thing they came out very publicly and said, no, he's just not going to play that role. He's welcome to come back here and play a different role should it arise. Yep. Well, after this week, we have a foundation of where we're going with the projects that were announced. Yeah. And Pat's going to be reading them off, and we're going to kind of give our thoughts and opinions on them. Yeah, so I'm reading this from an article on the HollywoodReporter.com, which, if you want to look it up, the uh, headline is DC Slate Unveiled, New Batman, Supergirl Movies, a Green Lantern TV Show, and more from James Gunn, Peter Safran. So just reading through the list of artic- uh, on the article, uh, this first chapter, I guess we can, we can call it, is being billed as Chapter 1, Gods and Monsters, which... Hell of a title. You know what? I like giving it that little flair. It's different than just phase one from the folks over at Marvel or something a little bit different. Wasn't that an animated film for DC, though? I think it might have been. Yeah. like It, it rings a bell. I could swear to you mm-hmm. that, that, yeah, that was an animated film, 2015, Gods yeah. and Monsters, okay. Justice League. Okay. Uh, so reading from the list on uh, the HollywoodReporter.com, uh, one of the one things announced, Creature Commandos, uh, which the article says, quote, a seven episode animated series written by Gunn that is already in production. Originally a team of classic monsters assembled to fight Nazis. This is a modern take on the concept. The voice actors have yet to be cast, but the executives are looking to find people who can voice the animated characters and also portray the live action versions when they when the anti-heroes show up in the movies and series close quote. And, and that's the th- case going forward for all DC projects that James Gunn made very specific and clear in the video he posted to his Twitter. I know it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, it's it's everywhere if you haven't seen it. But when they when they're going to do kind of the Marvel method where one actor plays one character. Right. You know, so there ain't going to be this crossover, they're playing multiple people and that goes for any projects going forward. So if, you know, Booster Gold for 
example, shows up in live action on a TV, on, let's just say season two of Peacemaker, whatever, right. the, whatever the hell it ends up being. That person is going to play Booster Gold in an animated series, an animated movie, or, you know, another uh, feature film. With the exception of Matt Reeves, the Batman, yes. and uh, Todd Phillips, the Joker. Joker, which is in its own separate universe, which they titled Elseworlds. Which is perfect. If you're not familiar with, they do their alternate reality stories yep. under the Elseworlds banner. Yep. So, perfect. Yep. Love it. Uh, next up is Waller, uh, which says, quote, in a spinoff of Gunn's own HBO Max hit series Peacemaker, Viola Davis will return as the ruthless and morally ambiguous head of a government task force. It's being written by Crystal Henry, uh, who worked on Watchmen, and Jeremy Carver, the creator of the Doom Patrol TV series, close quote. Well, no real shock here. No. I, mean, I think if anything was certain with this announcement, we knew that the fallout from Peacemaker would be Mm -hmm. making its way to the next phase. Yeah. Because obviously that was James Gunn's first dip into the DC franchise. Uh Uh-huh. Rave reviews for the Peacemaker show starring John Cena. Well, and especially Viola Davis. Ever since she made her first appearance as Amanda Waller, and I want to say it was the original Suicide Squad movie, uh, you know, she's been literal perfect casting for that role. Yeah, there's no other person that can play that role. None. No. And she absolutely crushes it as the ruthless leader of Task Force mm-hmm. X. Mm-hmm. Now, what this show is going to do, is it going to spin into another Suicide Squad? We don't know. We don't know. The only thing that was said in that press co- or the video vignette he did, this is dealing with the fallout from Team Peacemaker. Right. So, I wouldn't doubt we see Vigilante show up. Probably. Yeah, because I want to say I read someplace that this is taking place in between seasons one and two. Yeah. So, the uh, whatever comes of this is probably going to lead into season two of Peacemaker. Yeah, I, I definitely fully see that happening. Uh, next up is Superman Legacy, which uh, says, quote, the movie featuring the Man of Steel that Gunn is writing and may direct, although no commitments on that end have been made. While the two previous titles are meant to be uh, aperitifs in Safran's words, uh, Superman is the true kickoff of the duo's DCU plans. Quote, it's not an origin story, Safran said. It focuses on Superman balancing his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing." He is the embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way. He is kindness in a world that thinks that kindness is is old-fashioned. A release date of July 11th, 2025 has been penciled in. Well, I mean, this is a no-brainer. Right. If you're going to restart the DC Universe, it starts with Superman. Uh-huh. And it gets back to basics. Yep. So, as much as we all love Henry Cavill, yeah. I understand where he's going with, with this. I don't have any issues. Yeah. I, I want to see, though, what he's going to be borrowing from the source material. Right. I have been hearing this for all seasons, which, listen, that works. But they really need to establish why Superman is Superman. Mm -hmm. Truth, justice, and a better tomorrow. If we don't have that, it doesn't mean a damn thing. Mm -hmm. But I have full faith in what James Gunn is doing. He's being very hands-on with this, which is good, because if you're going to go this route, you need to make sure this one doesn't fail. Of all the other projects, this needs to win. Period. Oh, yeah. And uh, Gunn did make some comments to the (laughs) Hollywood Reporter uh, in an interview regarding Henry Cavill, uh, saying, quote, We didn't fire Henry. Henry was never cast. For me, it's about who do I want to cast as Superman and who do the filmmakers we have want to cast. And for me, for this story, it isn't Henry. Uh, Quote, and then he went on to say, I like Henry. I think he's a great guy. I think he's getting dicked around a lot. Uh, dicked around by a lot of people, including the former regime at this company. Ooh. But this Superman is not Henry for a number of reasons, close quote. Well, very telling with that statement. Uh-huh. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Um, but, but he's right, though. I mean, because there's the whole thing. As much, and we've t- and I want to get you fired up because I know the subject does get you mad. Sure. As much as the Snyderverse has a fan base that won't give up the dream. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, the whole Netflix thing. This is a situation, if you're hitting the reset button, you need to hit it hard oh, yeah. with the core characters. Now, Amanda Waller is not a core character she's of all, DC. She's all, well, she, you know, in, in regards to the movies, she's never interacted really outside of that one bonus scene in, in Suicide Squad. Well, Black Adam. Oh, that too. With Black Adam, she's never really interacted with, like, the core <laughs> group. Yeah, I was going to say the original Suicide Squad uh, movie with Ben Affleck. Right, the bonus yeah. Scene there. yeah. But, but, but it gets back to the point. When you talk about the core characters of DC, right? it's the original seven of the Justice League. Yeah. 
Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, Green Lantern, Martian Manhunter. Yeah. Like, that's your core group. Yep. So I understand why he's hitting the reset there. He's going to need to. Albeit, though, there's one project that we we might see one hangover from. Though. Okay. But we'll get to it when we discuss okay. it. Uh, but in terms with the Superman movie, I'm glad they're, you know, it's not going to be an origin story. We know what it is at this point. We've seen it. Yeah. How, we've seen it how many times between film and, and TV. Don't need another origin story. Uh, next one up is Lanterns, which says, quote, Greg Berlanti's long in the works Green Lantern TV series has been scrapped and Gunn and Safran have parted ways with the longtime <laughs> DC uh, series steward. In its place will be a new take on the space cops with power rings. Our quote, our vision for this is very much in the vein of true detective Safran described. It's terrestrial based. It will feature prominent lantern heroes, Hal Jordan and John Stewart. and is one of the most important shows they have in development. This quote, this plays a really big role into leading into uh, the main story we are telling across film and TV. Close quote. Well, I'm definitely excited for this. Yeah. You give me a true detective style, which has been the rumor this show is going to be. Mm-hmm. With Hal Jordan and John Stewart. Oh, yeah. Like, listen, Kyle Rayner would be cool. Guy Gardner is Guy Gardner, whatever. Yeah. No. And all the other Lanterns you can pull in for. If you want to do like a, a space cop show. Probably going to be, yeah. And make it really dark and twisted. Yeah. Like, this is perfect. Like, give this to me. Oh, I, I'd love it. This is this might be arguably the project I'm most excited about, to right. be honest with you. Yeah. And it's good we finally have some answer and some, I guess, closure on what was happening with the Greg Berlanti series, which, yeah. which I figured, you know, it was announced so long ago, and we heard jack all about it since. Right, same thing with Strange Adventures. Yeah. Uh, next up is The Authority, which the article says, quote, a movie based on a team of superheroes with rather extreme methods of protecting the planet that first originated in the late 1990s under an influential imprint known as Wildstorm, run by artist and now head of DC publishing, Jim Lee. Quote, one of the things of the DCU is that it's not just a story of heroes and villains, said Gunn. Not every film and TV show is going to be about good guy versus bad guy. Giant things from the sky come and good guy wins. There are white hats, black hats, and gray hats, added Saffron. They are kind of like Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men. They know what you want from them on the wall, or at least they believe that. Close quote. Okay, I will be honest. Never in a million years that I think the authority would be optioned. Right. Never. And I know you're not familiar with them. Nope. But the minute I heard this, I freaked out. I was like, are you, wait, wait, what? Because the thing is, yeah, this was the spinoff of Stormwatch from Wildstorm. Okay. When Jim Lee formed Image Comics way back in 93. Okay. They went and they all had their own sub-universes. Mm-hmm. So think of it like this. Rob Liefeld had Extreme Studios. Mark Silvestri had Top Cow. Jim Lee had Wildstorm. So under Wildstorm, you had Wildcats. You had Gen 13. You had um, Stormwatch. Okay. Like, what works. Like, you had a bunch that were under that banner. Stormwatch was a unique concept in the sense, like, it was a team book, but it was, like, backed by the United Nations. Sure. And what rolled into it, like, they were basically doing – you know, the uh, dirty work, so to speak. Okay. The authority rolled out of that, and it is an insane version of the Justice League, like you can almost call it that. Okay. Which they have many popular characters. The one that has been featured more so lately, like in the past 10 years, in the DC universe is Midnighter. Okay. Which you might know. Okay. But they have a really eclectic group. I'm going to read this from DCComics.com. Sure. So they have Jenny Sparks, a woman who can manipulate electricity. And if it wasn't enough, she's also considered the spirit of the 20th century. Born in 1900, she stopped aging when she turned 19 and has been secretly influencing the century's biggest turning points. Mm. Apollo, who is like their their Superman. Uh, Solar battery with super strength and vulnerability in flight. Sound familiar? Mm. Apollo is also one of the first openly gay superheroes to appear in a mainstream comic. He's married to Midnighter, okay. one of his teammates. Midnighter, as we previously mentioned, is a former soldier with enhanced abilities. Well, probably the most widely known member of the Authority because he did have a self-titled um, series, I want to say, with the New 52. Okay. And he's shown up in books like Nightwing and a couple others. Like, he's been around. Midnighter can, going back to quote, and like I said, all this is pretty much quoting, is quoting the article, DCComics.com. 
Midnighter can see how a battle plays out before it happens. And he's basically like, think about Batman on Venom, mm-hmm. unhinged, like doesn't give a fuck and will kill people just doing it. And, you know, it happens. That's him. Oh, okay. So you will you, you be the one that's uh, very, very uh, highly talked about in this right, project. Right, Because, like I say, he is just, he's 100% walking violence. Mm. But, like I say, it's, it's he just adds a different dynamic to this group. And like I said, he's married to Apollo. Mm, okay. So, that, I mean, that also, you know, is going to be a great pairing to see on screen, too. I'm excited to see how that is. And then the other members, too, you got Jack Harsmore, who's, uh, basically, uh, somebody who's been experimented on and has got a weird like connection to cities, right? But like I say, it's it plays into this book. Okay, and they have a couple other members too. Okay, and like I say, DCComics.com paraphrased and quoted some of the stuff too. If you want, they got a great article up breaking down this team. But my God, yeah, like the fact that this got picked up. And they've tr- they've tried bringing it back in different incarnations. And I know that there was a Grant Morrison series, right? Superman and the Authority. Yes, a couple of years ago. Right. So not saying this is going to connect with Superman. Like, we don't know too early. Right. But the fact that we're seeing an authority book is blowing my mind in all the right reasons. Yeah. Because this is going to definitely, uh, you know, think about if you merge the uh, elements of the boys' morals. Yeah, I kind of I got that vibe just from <laughs> the description they provided on the Hollywood Reporter article. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, Next up is titled Paradise Lost, uh, which the article says, quote, the duo described this as the described this HBO Max series as a Game of Thrones style drama set on the all female island that is Wonder Woman's birthplace, Themyscira, filled with political intrigue and scheming beyond pop between power players. It takes place before the events of the Wonder Woman films, close quote. So this is the one I was going back to and saying, Gail Godot, I could see showing up here. Maybe. Maybe because like the thing about Paradise Lost, you're right. It is like Game of Thrones. It's going to be the early beginnings of Themyscira. Right. So it's not to say you wouldn't see a cameo. Like I don't, but I think how they're going to do it is a very cool concept. I think they've done it a few times in the comics, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So I kind of have to wait to see how it plays out. But I'm in, I'm intrigued by that show. Oh, I am. T- I am too. Uh, next up is titled uh, Batman: The Brave and the Bold. Uh, which says, quote, this is the introduction of the DCU Batman said gun of Bruce Wayne. And it also introduces our favorite Robin, Damian Wayne, who is a little son of a bitch. Uh, this the movie will take inspiration from the now classic Batman run written by Grant Morrison that introduced Batman to a son he never knew existed. A murderous tween raised by assassins. It's a very strange father and son story. And importantly, it will feature a Batman not played by Robert Pattinson. Uh, so that will close quote. Yeah, which, listen, I think it's perfect. Oh, I do too. I am, sh- well, I'm not shocked that we're going to see Damian Wayne. No, I'm not either. But we're doing the Grant Morrison story. Yeah, we are. That's going to get fucking weird. Yeah, we are. In a hurry. Uh-huh, which you also know this <laughs> is eventually probably going to lead to Jason Todd. I wouldn't doubt you. we see more of the Bat Family show up. Uh, I think this is going to be the introduction to the, of the Bat Family, which admittedly we have not seen since George Clooney, Batman, and Robin. Yeah, which I will also say this. I wouldn't doubt by the end of this series, mm-hmm. we might, and I'm stressing might, mm-hmm. see Dick Grayson as Nightwing because there I was a time, there was a time period they did Batman and Robin where Dick had the mantle because Bruce was dead in space and right. you know that that right. old right. messy situation. Right, and Damian had to go run with him. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, speaking of Pattinson, is the Batman sequel, which uh, this article reads, quote, Pattinson will continue to portray the Dark Knight in, an, in at least one more crime saga movie directed by Matt Reeves. That movie, the executives revealed, will be released October 3rd, 2025, and is being titled The Batman Part 2. Uh, quote, 2025 is going to be a very big year for DC, crowed Saffron, Superman and Batman within the same year, close quote. Well, we knew a sequel was coming. Oh, Absolutely. And the fact it's Elseworlds is smart. Let, yeah. let Reeves do what Reeves does. Yeah. And it's not going to upstage anything. Like, no. Listen, listen to be honest do what you, with you. Do, do like Nolan did. Do a trilogy, knock it out of the park, and ride off into the sunset. Yeah. 
I mean, if you wanted to bring Pattinson back, I mean, I'm sure money talks. Oh yeah. If you wanted to do that, if you if you really wanted to try tying together, but why? You're well, gonna... I, I think if I remember right, they were only supposed to do one movie, and I think he only signed on to do one movie. But then he had such a fun time doing it, and the movie did so well that they eventually turned around like, "Hey, we want to do another movie." And he's like, "As long as Reeves is in, I'm in." Yeah, I thought I thought he he got locked up for three. Oh, okay, I could so. be wrong. Yeah, no, but like I think you're right. Like I think it was supposed to be a one and 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 signed on pay, based on uh, success, right? And yeah, but he's locked in for three. Okay. So, which tell him the trilogy. That's, yeah. that's all I need. To say. Yeah. Next up is Booster Gold, which the article says, "quote An HBO Max series based on a unique, lesser-known hero created in 1986." Safran said of the series, it's about a loser from the future who uses basic future technology to come back to today and pretend to be a superhero. Gunn described it as imposter syndrome as a superhero, close quote. Yeah, this is going to be interesting to see on screen. Booster Gold has a very, very big cult following. I was going to say, like, the article says a lesser known hero, like, lesser known to the author. Yeah, lesser known to the author of this article. Yeah, Booster has a cult following much like nova in marvel Mm -hmm. same kind of vibe yeah not gonna lie yeah so it'll be interesting to see how this one does i i think this is one they're gonna have a lot of fun with yeah i don't know who they're gonna cast in that role i know people are trying you know fan cast uh chris pratt Mm, okay which i could see yeah i could see it. you're gonna need somebody to get real cheesy with this role. real cheesy real charismatic yeah which i'm here for chris evans maybe uh i could like i'm just thinking chris evans and like how cheesy and, and kind of goofy he was in knives out yeah. I can, I'm just throwing it out. It could happen. Uh, next up is Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, uh, which reads, quote, Taking its cues from the recent Tom King written miniseries, this movie promises a different take than what most think of when Superman's cousin comes to mind. Quote, We will see the difference between Superman, who was sent to Earth and raised by loving parents from the time he was an infant, versus Supergirl, raised on a rock, a chip off Krypton, chip off of Krypton, and who watched everyone around her die and be killed in terrible ways for the first time, uh, for the first 14 years of her life, and then come to Earth. She is more hardcore and not the Supergirl we're used to, close quote. Yeah, I'll be honest. I've not read this story. I've heard nothing but raves about it. I've heard that too, yeah. So I'm excited. You know, like, if you're going to do it, and especially with the, the praises coming out of the source material, right? I'm on, I'm all on board with it. Uh, and then lastly, of the ones that they announced, Swamp Thing, uh, which reads, quote, a horror film that promises to close out the first part of the de- first part of the chapter, close quote. Well, I, Swamp Thing, I think, is uh, money on the table. Yeah. That, you know, obviously the CW show that came over via the DC Universe. And, and people forget that that was actually going okay until they had some financial trouble. Right. You know, like I forgot. I think it was like a tax break that didn't work out. It's been a while, folks. Yeah. But... That being said, if they want to go back to it, Swamp Thing, you can make some money off of. And especially in the right hands, which I believe they have the director of Logan, James Manigold. Uh, yes, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, he has been tagged to this as well as an early okay. lead. So, like, okay. listen, I'm here for it. Yeah, uh, and they did bring up briefly the slate of movies they got coming up uh, this year, which include uh, Shazam! Fury of the Gods, which is coming out in March. Uh, the Flash, which is coming out in June, Blue Beetle, which is coming out in August, and then Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which is coming out in December 25th. I mean, listen, Gunn is still calling The Flash, uh, you know, quote, probably one of the best superhero movies ever made, close quote. We'll see. Well, okay, l- l- let me break this down in an editorial stance. So my opinion on this is he's not going to bury the film. Right. They still need to make money off this. Yeah. It might be the biggest pile of flaming hot garbage, mm-hmm. and you're not going to hear them say a bad word about it. That's the same reason, and I, I know I was in a couple chats uh, talking about this too, about Ezra Miller's future as The Flash. Mm-hmm. Why would you tell a pop culture fan base he's fired, but yet we're still going to push this movie? Like, how much sense does that make? No, nah, not much. So... The fact that they are, they're still going to pump this, yeah, because they want to make money off this. Mm-hmm. Because if they take a big L with this movie and with all the bad PR about Ezra, yeah, it's not out of the realm of thought. Yeah. So why are we sitting here and like flipping out about Gunn's comments? Because what's he going to do? Shit on it? Yeah. Like, no. Like seriously, like no. for, for everybody that's like losing their mind about this, it's like pump back and see the big picture. Yeah. They need to make a profit because if this doesn't make a profit, when they try doing some of these other projects, 
that they haven't even announced yet. Right. Well, if it comes back, well, you didn't make money with the Flash. It's not on them, but they still have to try scalvaging or salvaging up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, whatever was left over from the former yeah. regime. Well, and, and the article does go on to say, quote, uh, Gunn also said that the, the four leads of those films could potentially return to their roles in DCU projects down the line. Quote, there is nothing that prohibits that from happening, said Gunn. Among those actors is Ezra Miller, the troubled star of The Flash, who was has found themselves at the center of several criminal investigations. They, ple- they uh, pleaded guilty to trespassing earlier this month, and who, in August, announced they were seeking treatment for c- complex mental health issues. Safran said the executives remained hopeful Miller is on a path to betterment. Quote, Ezra is completely committed to their recovery. We are fully supportive of that journey they are on right now. When the time is right, when they are ready to have that discussion, we will all figure out what's be- what's the best path forward. But right now, they are completely focused on their recovery, and in our conversation with them in the last couple of months, it feels like they are making enormous progress, close quote. Well, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, it's good to see if he's getting help and, you know, he's yeah. taking steps in the right direction. Well, the fa- but the fan base has already pretty much spoken. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. That is, you know, until we really see something change for him yeah i think everybody's still gonna be very skeptical about this movie yeah but i understand what they're doing from a business point yeah that kind of sums everything up with that yeah but it it sounds like you know (laughs) with these those those uh flash shazam and then uh aquaman Aquaman. it sounds like that might be the end of the previous regime of films it's going to be a case-by-case basis if we see what happens with those actors and actresses and what have you from those franchises going forward you know could we see you know zachary levi come back as she said maybe you know, it depends on what they have and if the if the character is right for the story they're telling. Because I think a lot of people would agree, myself included, opinions about the Snyder verse aside, Henry Cavill's a fucking amazing Superman. Oh, absolutely. In in terms of playing Clark and playing the the role of Superman, he's fucking phenomenal. You know, one of the best to do it, if not the best to do it. But clearly for the role and for what James Gunn is writing, he's not the right he's not the right person for right. for it. So Zachary Levi, in my opinion, now granted, I've only seen two performances of Shazam and that one. One was the animated series and one was in these movies. But Zachary Levi plays a phenomenal Shazam. But if they decide to bring Shazam into the DCU going forward, if Zachary Levi doesn't fit the bill of what they're wanting to tell, don't get all up in arms about it because, hey, listen, they like the guy. You know, it's just he's not right for the role. So it's, it's going to be a case-by-case basis, and we'll see. I think you're, you hit it right on the head, Pat. I think it's going to be case-by-case. I think the only safe bet is Flash is done. Right. And, and it, like, listen, this movie could make a billion dollars. Right. They're still going to recast. Yeah. There's no. I'm, I'm sorry, like, for everybody that's, like, really worried about this, he's going to reset the timeline. He's going to disappear in said timeline. Yep. Spoiler alert. It's going to be like the end of the Justice League Dark Apocalypse War movie. Yeah. Where, like, things went to absolute... Spoiler alert. Things went to absolute shit, and then Barry went to do basically another Flashpoint and reset the universe, and that was the end. Yeah. Shazam, I also think, is done after this. As much as I love them. Like, I I, I really enjoyed the first one. I'm excited about the second one. I mean, I think that's the case. I mean, Cavill's not coming back. All signs are pointing to Dwayne Johnson not coming back as Black Adam. So there go your two big matchups you could do for a third film. Right, because that's the thing. If you don't have Black Adam, it it makes no sense. Which, which, let's let's be clear. Neither said has neither side has said they're done with each other. We're not going to make another Black Adam movie, but they're not exactly announcing it. And you just kind of got to read between the lines of what yeah, they've said in the past. Exactly. So, like I say, I'm not holding any breath on that one. No, Aquaman is tricky. Uh, yeah, because you know they've said they've said he he's perfect for Aquaman, but then he also wants to play Lobo. So we'll see. Well, I think you're going to have this. I wouldn't doubt that they lay they label the sequel that's coming out this year. Yeah, as Elseworlds. Well, maybe. Then you can write that in if they yeah. want to go Lobo. Yeah, yeah. But then again, here here becomes your question. All right. As much as we all want to see Lobo as the comic fan base. Sure. I don't know how Lobo translates to the pop culture audience. The only exposed... Now, I'm speaking from this as a mostly pop culture sure. guy because I didn't start reading the comics up until the last decade or so. Yeah. The only exposure Lobo has had outside of the comics was a couple of episodes in Superman the Animated Series in the 90s. Right. And then uh, he might have shown up in an episode of two of either Justice League or Justice League Unlimited. 
I can't speak for any of the newer cartoons, whether he showed up in that, but for the ones I know, like the, the Justice League, Justice League Unlimited, you know, Batman, the animated series and all those spinoff ones. And then uh, Superman, the animated series, he showed up in a couple of episodes for Superman, the animated series. And then he might have shown up for like one or two episodes of Justice League Un- or Justice League Unlimited. Yeah. So it's not a real big exposure. Right. And that that's one thing. I mean, Jason Momoa could absolutely carry a film right. if they want to do it. <laughs> but I think it's just it's tricky about what you want to do with the new universe. Right. Like, we take a look at the 10 projects that they've announced. Creature Commandos is the, like, the picture-perfect James Gunn project. Yeah. Frankenstein and monsters in World War II. Yep. Boom. <laughs> That's all you need. And trust me, this thing is going to be a monster. Pun intended. Aha. Uh-huh. Then you also see he's playing it safe by doing Superman and Batman and Robin. Right. And Paradise Lost, which... The concept might be a little crazy, but I think it's a it's a perfect way to do a Wonder Woman story now mm-hmm. until you figure out what direction you want to go with her mm-hmm. and still have a very cool idea for a movie. Yeah. And I think they got it right there, too. Yeah. Supergirl is kind of a little crazy uh, in the sense of we weren't really sure what the future was going to be there. But right. if you're going to do Woman of Tomorrow storyline, I think it's perfect. And like I said, from everything I've heard about this, I'm going to make a point to read this sooner than later. Mm-hmm. I think that this is going to be a, a great way to transition her to the big screen. Right. And then you take a look at some of the other books that are coming. Booster Gold. Uh-huh. I think that that's going to be a fun project. I But it'll be a t- you'll hear by the time it's all said and done, where's Ted Cord? Right. And where's Blue Beetle? Right. I'm just going to say that right now. Uh, the other thing got mentioned and brought up was uh, Superman and Lois, uh, the, one of our favorite television shows going right now. Uh, switching over to an article from Variety.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, The article says, quote, Superman and Lois is expected to continue for one or two more seasons, according to DC Studios heads James Gunn and Peter Safran. The future of the CW series was revealed by the pair at a press event on Warner Brothers lot on January 30th, at which they laid out their initial development slate. Uh, When asked about Superman and Lois, Gunn said, quote, it's a show everybody, everybody likes. So it's going to keep around for keep going for a little bit. Close quote. Gunn and Safran were also asked about the future fate of the upcoming CW series, Gotham Knights, though neither had any commitment. That show will debut its first season on March 14th. Uh, close quote. So Superman and Lois sticking around for at least a couple more seasons. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, Gotham Knights to be determined. Yeah. Another case of we're not going to say it until it comes out. Uh huh. Just putting that out there, too, for the karma. Yeah. But I guess overall, I mean. I'm happy with the slate that we saw. Yeah, like I, it's it's not like the standard, oh, we're going to do a Superman movie and a Batman and an Aquaman. And like, no, they're taking some risks. They're setting up some larger stuff, and I like it. Yeah, no, Creature Commando is a big risk, but it's, like I said, this is picture perfect James Gunn. Yeah. The authority is a big risk. Right. But that's because if fans are thinking this is going to be Justice League, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. This is going to be completely different. But like I say, I like the team. And I, I'm going to be very interested to see the pop culture reaction to this team because they're violent and brutal and just absolutely go off the place. And I can like I said, I love Apollo and Midnighter. So I can't wait to see them on the screen too. I'm super excited about that. And then you have Batman and Robin, mm-hmm. which Damian Wayne live action, long overdue. Yeah, long yeah overdue. absolutely. Long overdue. So there's literally something for everybody here. Uh huh. And I think that's smart for Gunn to do. Because I know people are, uh, you know, complaining we didn't hear anything about Green Arrow. I think it's coming at some point. When when the first chapter is titled "Gods and Monsters," uh, Green Arrow is neither a god nor a monster. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I say, and it also depends on your ver- your definition of gods too. Because yeah. Booster Gold considered a false god. Yeah, if you know his story, and then you literally have some monsters in this set of two. Mm-hmm. But overall, I think. He's got a good sense of direction where it's going. I do, too. I think Lanterns is going to be the most interesting show out of this. Yeah. I'm all in for authority. I can't stress that enough. And whatever he's going to do with Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, I, he's definitely made a point to establish the Trinity again. Oh, absolutely. Which you have to. Yeah. If you're going to do DC films, this is the direction you need to go in. So as us fans, we have a lot to be excited about, and we have a lot to speculate about. So that being said, hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about James Gunn's DC film Slate? Are you excited? I know the Twitter poll said people are very, very excited. Are you not? And what projects are you excited to see on screen? Let's have that discussion, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. 
Hi, and welcome to The Capsule Life, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. You can also check out our website, www.thecaptionlife.com, to find out where you can listen to us, a list of all of our episodes, and where you can find us on social media under the username at Caption Life. You'll get a new episode from us every week, so hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Coming back for another segment of this edition of the ODPH podcast, and what an episode. Holy shit. You know, we did, unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts last week, we didn't get to do a full ODPH recap of the hit show on HBO Max entitled The Last of Us. Uh-huh. And last week's episode was very good. Yeah. No question about it. But my God, episode three Mm -hmm. of this Smash show based off the Naughty Dog video game has blown everybody away that has seen it, Mm -hmm. and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Pat, I know you got numbers of viewership. Yeah, so in terms of viewerships, uh, reading from an article over at Variety.com, the article says, quote, The Last of Us has become a bona fide hit for HBO after achieving record-breaking viewership for both Episode 1 and Episode 2 and scoring an early (laughs) renewal for a second season. The series has already reached new heights with 6.4 million viewers, having tuned in to the third installment. Sunday. The number comes from a combination of Nielsen's measurement of linear viewers across airings of episode three on HBO on Sunday, plus Warner Brothers Discovery's own first party data regarding streams on HBO Max through the night. Uh, the audience of The Last of Us is still climbing at this point is a significant feat. The series entered HBO roster, HBO's roster as the brand's second most viewed series premiere in over a decade, comparable only to the debut of House of the Dragon in 2022. And by its third episode, House of the, viewership, House of the Dragon viewership was already dropping. By contrast, The Last of Us Episode 3, 6.4 million viewers, represents a 12% increase from last week's 5.7 million, which was itself a 22% improvement on the first episode's 4.7 million. Yeah. Close quote. I'm not going to crown it just yet, but this is easily on its way to that Walking Dead level Mm -hmm. of pop culture status. Uh Uh-huh. In three episodes, yeah, the performances by Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey Mm -hmm. in the title roles of Joel and Ellie, yeah, have won over fans in a market that I don't think they were expecting, and that's the pop culture audience. Mm -hmm. The video game fan base is very, very tough. Oh, yeah, it's one of the best selling video games in uh, PlayStation history, right? So, expectations are high there. And then you have you know other fandoms of you know HBO, they have high standards. You know, the people just strictly watch HBO Max. Yeah. But crossing over to the pop culture audience and winning them and word of mouth has spread about this, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. you now know what kind of hit you have on your hands. Yeah. And I will say this. After going on social media Sunday night after this happened, I was blown away by the outpouring of praise yeah. for this episode because I was right there with them. Absolutely. And I said, just seeing the reaction, absolutely just give the, give the awards away right now. Yeah, it's going to win a ton of awards. Yep, on three episodes, and rightfully so because this episode that we're going to break down entitled Long, Long Time had so much amazing acting and drama in mm-hmm. fold. Mm-hmm. We like, I, I guess we'll just go right into the spoiler free talk. If you're new to the show, we give a spoiler free statement. After that, we get into a spoiler filled discussion. We timestamp it in the episode. You have a countdown to duck out. If you need to, man, we got to get into this. So you've been fair warned. If you were new to the show, first and foremost thing, and thank you for coming on the show. We we appreciate you giving us your time and, you know, being part of the group here. Mm hmm. But that said, I know I'm messing up my words. I really want to talk about this episode. So, Pat, spoiler free statement. One of the best, <laughs> if not the best, episodes of anything I've ever seen, mm. period. You know, this was this started off for me where I was like kind of like, oh, all right, where's this going? I, I wasn't quite sure where the story was going. But by the end of it, I was 
gutted you know i was emotionally drained you know i was i was watching it with my girlfriend uh les bailey and we were just so emotionally drained from this episode because we were not expecting this in any way shape or form that you know to to see what happened and the way it transpired and the way it played out was a freaking masterpiece nick offerman and murray bartlett Mm -hmm. or bartlett give them the awards now yeah Seriously, they told one of the most beautifully tragic love stories I have ever seen on film, TV, or in comics. Their performance elevated this episode to so so much heights that we didn't even have uh, Pedro Pascal in it that much. No. This was all about establishing them and their love story. And I I literally sat there with you, Pat. I was, I was just emotionally drained yeah like i have not felt like that after watching something or reading something in quite some time and i was like god damn like this is this is cinema this is amazing acting and writing on the top high level Mm -hmm. and fan reaction has been across the board receptive and praising this as well so that said three two one talk to me this was quite simply one of the best television shows I've seen in any form, you know, whether it be live action, animated, you name it. This was incredible and perfect from start to finish. You know, I, I can't find one thing I have an issue with this episode. You know, I know IGN gave it a 10 out of 10, and I humbly agree with them. Mm-hmm. Same. The, the, Literally, I can't think of one thing in this to even like nitpick with, oh, you know what? Well, this could have been a little shorter. Oh, that could have been a little. No, like this. I know they made some deviations from the game and and I know some people took criticism with that. But listen, in, in certain instances, the deviation and the changes can be better. And this was one of those instances that it was a great little deviation they made from the game. And it just, you know, it took a moment in the game where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. And then you kind of expounded upon it, and you went, "Oh my god!" That it was, it was like I said, it was perfect. Yeah, the writers went into such a different lane than the video game, and it elevated their story so much. Like I said, this was a beautifully tragic love story. Yeah, I sat there, I was fucking in my emotions. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie about it. I was like, yeah. I was, I was like, by the time this got done, I was just like, fuck. Yeah, like I was just like, I have nothing. I have literally poured it out here, and. The job that the the pair did acting, like I said, I can't praise Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett enough. Like the job they did establishing these two characters that, let's face it, are not key elements of the story per yeah. se, <laughs> but they did it. Oh man, see, I'm I'm already starting to get worked up again too. This is not helping with my cold and cough. So, listening audience, please bear with me. But as this episode kicks off, Joel and Ellie are paying homage to Tess's final words Mm -hmm. of you need to stay on the mission. You need to get Ellie to where we might be able to cure this whole nonsense. Mm -hmm. And Joel is taking that to heart because obviously Tess sacrificed herself last episode to save them. And the instructions are, you got to go meet Frank and Bill. Mm -hmm. And during this time, Joel is also having this discussion with Ellie. And like I said, it's brief and it's overshadowed, and rightfully so. But he's talking about, yeah, the government during the original days of this outbreak. Oh, they were not nice people. No, uh, that's for goddamn sure. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, doing executions left and right. Yeah. You know, in, in complete and utter chaos, which, unfortunately, not super shocked at with what was going on at the pandemic of that yeah. story. Yeah. So we didn't do a time jump and we go back to 2007 Uh and we see that there is somebody who's, do we say thriving at this time? Kind of. I mean, as best as you can, given the circumstances where, of course, we remember with this timeline, uh, the, the apocalypse, I guess you could say kicked off in 2003. So we're four years into this and, and Frank, (coughs) you know, uh, or excuse me, Bill, is, is Nick Offerman's character is living in this compound of sorts where 
He's got a house. It's looking rather nice given everything. You know, we saw what was going on in, in Texas in, in episode one and how the looting and the burning and everything else was going on. So for him to be where he is and it, it looks picturesque, you know, yeah. it looks like something you'd see on a postcard. You know, so, uh, yeah, I'd say he's doing pretty damn well for himself, all things considered. Yeah, like I had, it was almost like the one city from The Walking Dead. Yes. And I'm blanking. Alexandria? Was, yeah, maybe early Alexandria. Like okay. where things were perfect. Yes. You know, not 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 the most recent uh, Commonwealth. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But, but it was like, okay, yeah. wait, you guys are somehow flourishing here. Yeah. Albeit, though, you made, a, a you know, adaptions here. Yeah. Because he does have a fence that's barbed wired off, and he does hear... Somebody making some noise in a trap that he has for the clickers that are, you know, walking around or any invaders. Mm-hmm. And as he goes to check out, he finds a gentleman is now trapped in his uh, hole in the ground. Yeah. And that is Frank, who's played by Marty Burlett or mm-hmm. Murray Burlett, Bartlett. I'm sorry. And then. Frank is basically saying, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not infected. I, I promise you. You know, I just I'm trying to get to another city. Yeah. You know, if, if, I just I just need to stay for a couple of days. Yeah, and Bill is very reluctant uh-huh. as he should be. Uh huh. Because but, let's face it, a person <laughs> shows up on your doorstep in these circumstances. You know, and I'm sure he's run into people where it's like, hey, let me let me stay with you, and they've had ill intentions, and he's had to kill them. Yeah. So obviously, and you, in in this post apocalyptic world, you can't take any chances. Yeah. But he does for some reason. Mm-hmm. He, he's got a feeling. Yeah. So he lets him come inside his house, and he lets him, you know, get showered up and have some food, and you can see there is a bit of, you know, trepidatious mm-hmm. this going on. Mm-hmm. But Bill is is kind of warming up to somebody else being around him. Yeah. And you do see that there is a moment where they go to the piano. Yep. And during this piano, Frank's is kind of playing a song Mm -hmm. and Bill tells him immediately stop. Mm -hmm. And Frank is basically saying like, uh, to paraphrase a bit, he's like, Oh, that that reminds you of somebody. And he said, yeah. And he's kind of like, that's not a wife, is it? Nope. And he's like, no. So they wind up coming from this moment into having, a passionate moment Mm -hmm. and you see that now they are together that he basically frank stays yeah and doesn't leave he is now with bill i I think the unofficially married because kind of hard to get married in circumstances going on with the apocalypse and everything right but i think if if things were a little bit more normal they'd be married yeah so they are thriving in this new new world if you will Mm -hmm. and obviously you know enjoying the talks of music and yeah. And, you know, like more things that like couples do. Yeah. So you do have that. But we then jump down the timeline again. Uh-huh. And Frank is in contact with somebody on the radio. Yep. And who this turns out to be, Pad, is... Joel and Tess. Yes. So Joel and Tess make their way to Bill's compound, who he's not happy to see. Hell no. He is like, what are you we doing? We don't make friends. Yeah. Oh, I... I how Offerman delivered that Offerman's line. Offerman's so damn good. Yeah, he was amazing in this because, I mean, he understands. He's, he's completely paranoid yeah. about the world, which, yeah. listen, I'm not blaming him. He's not a doomsday prepper. He's a survivalist. Right. And he's just sitting there going like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, you know, we got to make friends. They're like, no, you don't. No. This is how we stay alive. And then you see that, you know, basically they're they're forming that bond a little bit. Right. Of what's going on. And and. Like I say, I don't want to say I got the vibe of front of me, mm-hmm. but I kind of did from their lunch date. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. They, yeah. Like, like, uh, Nick Offerman's character was like, I'm only putting up with this because Frank told me I had to. Yeah. So, and which is something you see with a lot of couples. Yeah. Oh yeah. I would say you, you, it's clearly, you know, the introverted person against the extroverted person mm-hmm. where Nick Offerman is clearly playing the introverted person <laughs> that is perfectly happy to stay home, eat some pasta and watch some Netflix. Whereas, where as, as his partner is the like, Hey, let's go out. Let's have drinks. Let's go, you know, do some mini golfing with some friends. And he's like, oh, I just don't want to. Right. Because Bill understands the rules of this world. And he's trying to keep everybody alive that he loves. Low profile. Yeah, which is Frank. So the fact that you're inviting more people in is causing for alarm. Mm-hmm. And this does come back to haunt him in a, in a little bit. 
A little bit. Because they do have invaders come on the property. Yeah, some people, whether it's they know about it or they just kind of stumble across it, they're kind of sneaking up on them while both Bill and Frank are asleep one night. And Bill had mentioned earlier in the episode, I want to say, about the, the booby traps. Yes. He, he didn't mention that, but we we didn't see him. But then once these uh, invaders showed up, boy, we saw those booby traps. Holy fuck. No, Bill was not fucking around. Yo, on, he, on yo, he, don't, he, he don't mess around. No, and you saw a great action sequences. Frank... Who is starting to show he's he's failing in health a little bit. He's, he's showing a little uh, <coughs> hitch in his step. Yeah. Uh, he tries going out to save him, and Bill winds up taking a bullet for him. Yeah. Because the, the attackers are trying to get in. But is they, well, what is it? If Bill gets... gets uh, he's, he's standing he's, in the middle of the road with a stand, sniper. He's standing in the middle of the road with a, with a sniper rifle or or, an assault, or a rifle with a scope. Yep. And he's, and he's holding his own, but Frank distracts him is what it ends up being. Because Frank wakes up, hears what's going on outside, sees Bill is gone, goes outside to like, hey, what the, he, he grabs a pistol. And he goes outside and he yells to Bill and Bill looks back towards him. Yep. And that's when he gets caught in the, in the stomach. Yeah. Because Frank is awoken by the fire that goes off. Yeah. Because, like we said, Bill's not fucking around this there, episode. There's, like, chainsaws or something that rise out of the ground that start hacking at legs. There's homemade flamethrowers popping out of the ground. This, this, like, this is insane. This is one of the most wild scenes going on. And you're Walking Dead, take notes. Yeah, I was like, I don't know who thought of this, but, my God, this is fucking brilliant. Fucking Walking Dead. Yeah, we got some uh, guard towers <laughs> and some prison walls. Yeah. Fucking Last of Us. Yeah, we've got flamethrowers. If we can ever do a time jump. I want to see Bill go to the Walking Dead universe. Oh, please. Give me give me three episodes on Tale of the Walking Dead. Please. Putting that out there. I know AMC reps are listening. Hi. There you go. But then we go back a little further, and you see, obviously, Frank and Bill's bond is still growing together after nearly losing one another. Uh-huh. And now in present time, yeah. Frank is dying. He's he's sick with something. They never say what. Right. right. But, it's, it, but all the only hint we get is it was because uh, Bill says... Oh well, we'll we'll find a doctor. We'll go find somebody who can help cure us. And Frank says, "Listen, even if we could, this illness was was incurable before all of this happened. Yeah. So it's something very terminal. Right. So we don't know what it is, but it's basically brought up that Bill wants to formally mm-hmm. marry Frank. Yeah. And then they say, you know, Bill says, "Okay, well, after I, I want you to euthanize me." Mm-hmm. And when they do, you know, after they get married, yeah. Well, Bill doesn't want to live without Frank. Yeah. So when Frank passes, Bill kills himself. Mm-hmm. Emotional scene. Yeah, and, and the music playing in the background. Just, <laughs> just this is you know because once they talked about you know the helping uh, Frank, Frank die. You know, I was like, Bill's probably not sticking around. Yeah. No, you could de- you could definitely tell like. And they even allude to this later because now when you have Joel and Ellie, yeah, you know, arrive at you know Bill's house, yeah, they find the letter that was left for Joel, yeah, and basically was saying Frank was my my reason to live. Mm-hmm. Once he was gone, I had no reason to live. Right, and you know, like tragically poetic. Well, well, and even Joel gets a little gutted too because. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ellie is the one who finds the letter. Yeah, and he and she, uh, Joel says to Ellie, "Read what it says." And Ellie starts to read the letter, but it gets to the part where it says, "Stick with Tess." Yeah, and Ellie stops, and and Joel pulls it from her, and that's yeah. when we get the rest of the so double whammy there. Yeah, no, they they definitely hit you right in all the feels with this one, and then the episode ends with the truck is now left. Yep, for Joel. Yep. So they take his truck and the weapons left for him, and you know, like whatever they had. Um, mm-hmm. and then there we go, Off yeah. the, you know, to go find Tommy. Yeah. End of scene. And, and the crazy other thing with this episode too, <laughs> is the song that they were playing in the episode was the song called long, long time by, uh, Linda Ronstadt. Uh, they played a cover of it during the episode, but during the end of the episode, uh, you heard the song with Linda Ronstadt singing, uh, according to the folks over at Spotify, they said in a tweet quote, on Sunday, January 29th, between 11 p.m. and midnight Eastern, there was a more than 4,900% <sighs> increase in U.S. streams of Long, Long Time by Linda Ronstadt. They're killing it with their music selection. Uh-huh. This music selection is un- uh, phenomenal. Yes. So definitely want to give the props there. But, I mean, Pat, final thoughts on this episode. Like I said, one of the best television episodes I've seen 
anywhere. You know, I literally can't find a thing to nitpick about. Like, yeah, I, I got I, nothing. I realize the video game thing is bugging some people, but maybe this is just me from watching Lord of the Rings <laughs> films and Harry Potter films and other stuff that's been adapted. I'm just so used to it in my head, like, yeah, things are going to change. Not everything's going to be a one to one adaptation. So it doesn't bother me when they change stuff. But in, in, a, in a lot of instances, the changes they make enhance the show. And like I said, this is one of those changes that enhanced the show and gave it so much depth. Because if you don't know in the video game, it's hinted at that that Bill and Frank were that Frank uh, was married was or excuse me Bill was was married and that he had a partner but they leave it at that they never expound on it and Neil Drunkman who wrote and created uh or was one of the writers and creators of the Last of Us video game series you know uh is is basically like hey we felt we needed to expand upon this and it is what it, and it is what it is and he did a phenomenal job yeah no he did so their their emotional you know story just elevated everything up yeah i mean that's the biggest thing with this love is love this was a a a perfect love story ended tragically yeah and this connects with everybody yeah i mean it's in the love story started off so nice because it's like oh hey even in the darkest of times you can find love yeah and then it went so dark yeah but it was beautifully told yeah like i say one of the most best episodes of tv you're gonna watch all year yeah even, even if you don't watch any of the other episodes in the series you really don't mm. need to watch the other no. ones to get this one you can just pop this one on you know and, and watch this one without any context like seriously go watch this do yourself a favor go, make sure to go check it out on hbo max wherever you are watching the last of us and definitely hit us up on the hashtag hashtag od page pod what is your thoughts about episode three entitled long long time definitely want to talk to some people about this we're gonna take a quick break we'll be right back Hey guys, it's Alan Dunford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH Podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about, uh, two of which are video game related, uh, and it has been reported in an exclusive at IGN that Xbox, Nintendo, and Sony won't be a part of E3 2023. Uh, The article on IGN.com says, quote, (coughs) E3's first physical event in four years was supposed to be a triumphant return for the trade show, an opportunity to recapture some of the excitement of past conventions, which historically have been a major show showcase events for the games industry however it appears that when e3 2023 hits the los angeles convention center in june it will be without three of its most important draws ign has heard from multiple knowledgeable sources that xbox sony and nintendo won't be part of e3 2023 or have a presence on the los angeles convention center show floor This information comes on the heels of Xbox's announcement last week that it would be returning to Los Angeles for its annual summer showcase while declining to confirm whether it would be part of the show itself. Speaking with IGN last week, Xbox CEO Phil Spencer said the platform holder said the platform holder is timing its showcase with E3 at a moment convenient for press and even consumers at the event, meaning it's likely to roughly align with the event itself. Spencer also stressed Xbox's public support for E3 and the Entertainment Software Association, or the ESA. However, IGN understands that Xbox won't have a booth on the show floor. Quote, E3 is just, to me, one of the seminal moments in gaming. I love the industry of going, I love the history of going down to LA, thousands of people there, getting to see great new things, getting to see people in the industry, the fan events that we've had. I definitely want that, that to continue, Spencer said. Xbox is on the board of the ESA, and I think a successful and healthy ESA is critical to what we're trying to go do. So we place our showcase like we always have done, at a time where hopefully it's convenient for press and even consumers that are going to the E3 event. And that's what we're going to try to do now. Uh, we will continue to work with ESA in terms of their plans. As I said, we're on board. We're on the board, and we want to make sure that uh, we are doing everything we can to help make E3 successful. Close quote. Uh, so this, for all intents and purposes, sounds like the end of E3 as we knew it. Yeah, no, I think it's. I think it's a wrap. I mean, yeah. If you if you can't draw on the big names, yeah, the big three. I mean, I hate saying it, but there's no point. I mean, because Ubisoft won't, or not Ubisoft, uh, Bethesda won't be there because they're a part. They're they're a part of Xbox. Yeah, you know, and if Sony's not gonna be there, you're not gonna have Insomniac there because they're a part of PlayStation. 
you know, and, and Nintendo's gonna, a big draw. So what are you going to have? You're going to have EA Games and Ubisoft, like, and whatever other smaller indie developers you can get. Like, it'll it'll probably take place this year just because, I mean, we're sitting here in February. It's it's too late in the game, I think, to cancel out and cancel the whole thing. Although, the last couple of years, you never know. But I think for all intents and purposes, E3 as we know it is no more. Well, I think it's a tough sell. Like, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to do it. But I think if next year when you try planning it out, if they're out, yeah, you got you got to take you got to take the L. Yeah, uh, and then the other bit of video gaming news <laughs> I have is that Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which is the sequel to uh, the previous Star Wars game from the folks over at Respawn, uh, Jedi Fallen Order, is being delayed six weeks. Uh, so reading from an article on IGN.com, uh, the article says, quote, in a statement posted on social media, well, uh, the, the game, by the way, has been delayed to uh, April 28th. Uh, the article says, quote, in a statement posted on social media, director Stig Asmundsen uh, addressed the reasoning behind the delay, saying the team is focused on polishing the final release while enhancing performance. Quote, for the last three years, the Jedi team here at Respawn has poured its collective heart and soul into Star Wars Jedi Survivor. And we are proud to say the next chapter in the tale of Cal Kestis is content, is content complete. We are now focused entirely on the final stage. Bug fixes to enhance performance, stability, polish, and most importantly, the player experience. Jedi Survivor is a direct response to the feedback from our community, delivering expansive destinations to explore, evolved combat and traversal, and of course, the continuation of Cal and BD's story. Making this game has truly made us a better team, and we have pushed ourselves at every level to make this Star Wars sequel our fa- this the Star Wars sequel our fans expect from Respawn and Lucasfilm Games. In order for the team to hit the Respawn quality bar, provide the team with uh, the team the time they need, and achieve the level of polish our fans deserve, we have added six crucial weeks for our uh, to our release schedule. Star Wars Jedi Survivor will now launch globally on April twenty eighth. Thanks to EA Respawn for uh, and Respawn for giving us the time to deliver the best experience for our players and to all of you, uh, to all of you for the understanding. Close quote. So hey, another six weeks ain't really nothing to, to yeah, fuss about. Yeah, it's not like six months. Yeah, if anything, uh, hi, I'm looking at you, Cyberpunk 2077. You need a game to be perfect at launch in terms of no bugs, no nothing crazy, because otherwise it can kill your game. Yeah. You know, just look at some of past history. Enough said. Uh, so uh, I'm still excited to play it. Uh, and lastly, certainly not lastly, I got an audiobook recommendation Ooh. for folks. Uh, well, it's kind of an audiobook. It's a radio drama of sorts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is Star Wars, The High Republic, The Battle of Jeddah. Uh, it's an unabridged. Uh, it's written by George Mann. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's a fully uh, voiced audio cast. Or excuse me, fully voiced uh cast of characters voicing so it's not just one person reading it and modulating their voice a little bit to change it no it's it's guys and girls voicing various characters uh and the description of this is after the events of the high republic convergence the jedi travel to Jeddah in this all new star wars audiobook original uh jetta the worn streets in the, of this ancient world serve as a confluence for the galaxy visited by all yet owned by none Here, the Jedi are but one creed among many worshipping and studying the Force. From the Guardians of the Wills to the Path of the Open Hand, countless beings come to learn and to share in peace. As as all of Jedha prepares for its festival of balance, the galaxy still reels from the violence on Irem and Irino. Irino, uh, but after foiling a plot to escalate the war between the two planets, the Jedi believe that a lasting peace may be within reach. Master Crichton's son and Jedi Knight Ada Forte arrive on Jeddah with de- delegations from both planets to formally end the Forever War. The Jedi hope that the harmony of Jeddah's many factions, along with the signing of a peace treaty, will create a symbol to rest uh, to the rest of the galaxy of what can be accomplished through unity. Close quote. Uh, so, like I said, it's only five hours and twenty seven minutes, so relatively short in audiobook terms. Yeah, uh, it's runs. I want to say it's like twelve ninety nine, thirteen ninety nine for an audiobook. But like I said, it's a fully voiced cast. It's I've been listening to it. I'm a couple of, uh, about maybe a half hour, forty five minutes into it. Fucking phenomenal. So if you're a Star Wars fan, highly recommend you check it out. Definitely sounds interesting. Might have to go give that a shot. I'm not too big on audiobooks, but you, you might be selling me yeah. on this one. All right. So mine, I will keep it very short and sweet. Comic reviews, but I have to be uh, very honest. Last week, obviously, we had to switch up the schedule. Didn't get a chance to read off those. So if you didn't get a chance to pick up the following books, go check out Parley Points. I got reviews up for all of them. Ask for Mercy, number four, Comicsology Originals. Dudley Datsun and the Forever Machine, number four. 
Uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number two. Uh, that's been a great sequel going on, too, by the way. So Dan Moore and Ryan Perry have been killing it for Boom Studios. Damn Them All, number four. Excellent book to go check out. Book of Shadows, number three, from Valiant Entertainment. And obviously last week we gave props to one of the biggest debuts of 2023, Inferno Girl Red, book one, number one, Image Comics, Black Market Narrative. So all those were the ones I have reviews up for last week. Want to give them their fair due because I said we were going to mention them on the show, but last week got a little crazy with the schedule. So make sure to go get those. This week at the comic shops, Marvel, Silver Surfer Ghost Light, number Mm, one. So interesting story going on there. Over on DC, Lazarus Planet, Legends Reborn, number one. Uh, That's their big crossover event they have going on now, Lazarus Planet. So you definitely want to go check that out. And Parley Points reviews for this week. Three from Image, Blood Tree, number one. Now, Pat, I know you're not going to like this one. It's a horror book. Nope. But it's a it's a true crime story. Two detectives are chasing after a serial killer. Very cool twist in the story. They kind of tipped it off in the preview. So I'm not. I kind of stayed away from it. But you get the idea of what's going on here as well. But I don't want to spoil it for anybody. It's well worth picking up. Also, double shot from Black Market Narrative and Image Comics and the Massiverse, Radiant Black number 21 and Rogue Sun number 10. Which Rogue Sun number 10 is absolutely amazing. Radiant Black is always solid, so doing a lot of world building going on there for a big storyline coming up. But Rogue Sun number 10, you definitely want to make sure to go check out. And as always, make sure to go out and support your local comic shops and comiXology. You know, wherever you can go buy some digital books, go buy some books, digital or in person. That being said, for anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com where we have a big link on this week, too. Yeah, for the uh, Tyree Nichols uh, Memorial Fund, which, as we mentioned on the uh, ODPH Sports Edition, it, there is a f- uh, GoFundMe going on that is set up uh, and, if, and endorsed by the parents yes. uh, of Tyree Nichols, so it is official. It's not some random person trying to exploit the situation and get some money, uh, but the money will go to help the parents out and then also help set up a memorial and a skate park because Tyree Nichols did love to skate. Uh, so uh, well, good situation coming out of the unfortunate tragedy that took place down in Memphis. Yes, Definitely donate it if you can. Share it at the very least. That's it for this week for us. So for the one only Pat Awan J. Thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you as always for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ojo Duro Parlay Hour. My voice made it. We'll see you next time. <laughs>